Hallelujah. We want to come around the word of God this morning. It's a blessing to come around God's word. And you know what I just pictured this morning? I just pictured Jesus standing at the side and he said, I'm watching over my word to perform it in your lives. So no matter what's spoken this morning, it's at the word of God. And it will never return to him void. It will accomplish all that he has for us. And God wants to speak into our lives this morning. I want to just thank the Lord. Father, I just want to thank you for your word today, God. I just thank you for the privilege, Father God, of being in this place, Lord, and being able to worship you, Father, in spirit and in truth, O oh God. And I thank you, Father, for your word this morning that brings my faith, that builds my faith this morning, because I know, Lord, that faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes through the word of God. So, Father, we want to thank you for your word today. God, we just pray, God, that you will make us instruments of blessing this morning, God, as you use us in a powerful way, Father God, to minister your love and your grace to your people, Father, in and through the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. I want to minister this morning out of the book of John in chapter 8 and verse 12. And there's a tremendous verse of scripture here. I've entitled my message this morning, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Now there's an importance in that this morning because in this portion of scripture in John chapter 8 and 12 when Jesus spoke it says he spoke again to the people and he said I am the light of the world and whoever follows me will never walk in darkness but will have the light of life. They will never walk in darkness but will have the light of life. There's a, a certain men of an Indian tribe that would rise up every morning. This is just to help us to uh, explain a little bit more about the light today that Jesus is talking about. And this, these men of an Indian tribe, they'd rise up every morning and they'd perform an ancient ceremony. And they believed that as they per, uh, uh, performed this ancient ceremony that the sun would come up. Every morning when they would do this, that the sun would come up. They believed that if they failed to perform this ritual, that they would plunge the whole world into utter darkness. So they never dared to skip a day just to find out if it was true, but they continued every single day. They felt the risk would be too great if they were going to give her a miss. See, I love the light this morning. Don't you love the light? There's just something about when Jesus was saying about the light. There's something more to it than that. And I want to just explain that a little bit today. I love the light because the light changes atmospheres, doesn't it? The light changes the atmosphere. We love the brighter mornings. We love the brighter evenings. And even when summer comes and the sun starts to shine and we see a big difference and it makes a big difference in the life of people, the more happier when they see the sun or see its brightness. And it's true, without sunlight, life on this planet would quickly cease to exist. No plants would grow. The temperature would drop rapidly. And in just a short time, we would all be dead. But as vital as sunlight is to our physical experience or our physical existence, there's a light that's even more vital for our spiritual existence today. And it's that light that John describes in the book of John 1, chapter 9, where he says, as the true light gives light to every man. It gives light to every man. He, addre he addresses it as the true light. And this vital life-giving and sustaining light this morning is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. It's the Lord Jesus Christ himself. When you and I consider what Jesus had to say to these people, this re these religious people, he said, I am the light of the world. I am the light and whoever follows me will never walk in darkness but will have the light of the world. I am the light of the world. This is a claim that the Lord Jesus Christ made. This is a tremendous claim that the Lord Jesus made and it was made not long after the Feast of Tabernacles. A very spectacular part of this feast was the use of the great candelabras. And there were four big candelabras 
and all were filled with oil by the young men who had to climb 75 feet to fill the candelabras with the light. The light from these lamps, it said, was so brilliant that the Jewish writers say that there wasn't a courtyard in Jerusalem that didn't reflect the light. The brilliant illumination from these candelabras was a great, a great occasion for the city of Jerusalem. But when the feast was over, when the feast was over, the great candelabras, the great candelabras, they would go out. They'd no longer be light, be lighting. So, as it was in this great, great darkness, that formed the contrast with the brilliance of the light. It was completely black when the lights would go out. And it was in this darkness, it was in this darkness at this post festival period that Jesus Christ made this claim. And I was just thinking of this when a lot of us, we went to, to, to Widdenshaw Park and we'd see the bonfire. We used to go every single year, we'd see the bonfire. And you'd look at the park and the place would be brilliant. But eventually the, the fire would die down and the light would die down and it would die out. And you'd walk away and we'd all be coming home in the rain and the rustling of the leaves. And, all of the, and as we'd walk home, and if you look back you would see the place would be in total darkness, even darker than before. So he spoke not of only being a light for Jerusalem, but being a light to the entire world. And the imaginary that it, that's implied here is that the world was in darkness. The whole world was in darkness of sin, and men left to themselves cannot overcome this darkness. But Jesus claims that he can bring illumination, the illumination necessary to banish the darkness in which man lives. And he spoke through the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. And in the book of Isaiah 42, verse 6 and 8, he says, I, the Lord, have called you to demonstrate my righteousness. He said, I will take you by the hand and I will guard you. And I will give you to my people Israel as a symbol of my covenant to them. He says, and you will be a light to guide the nations, and you will open the eyes of the blind. He says, you will free the captives from prison, releasing those who sit in those dark dungeons. I don't know whether you can imagine this morning how terrible it must be to be blind, to sit in darkness, to never see, every single day the same, every night the same. And here in the book of Isaiah 49, 6, he says, You will do more than restore the people of Israel to me. He said, I will make you a light to the Gentiles, and you will bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And then he continues on in the book of Isaiah 51 and verse 4, and he says, Listen to me, my people. Hear me, Israel, for my law will be proclaimed, and my justice will become a light to all nations. See, Isaiah is telling us about the servant of the Lord that would be a light to all the Gentiles. And then here Jesus himself picks this up 700 years later and he begins to proclaim, I am that light. I am the light of the world. And whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Here Jesus' claim is that he is the true light. Jesus is not only a light for his followers, not even for all of Israel, but he's in a, a light for the entire world. For the entire world. This is an amazing claim. Just imagine the whole world was pitched into darkness, pitched into blackness. And a lot of us think, oh, that could never be. That could never be possible. But if we look and we see this pandemic even now that has affected the whole world, and here we see people, even in our world today, that every single person in the world, most people in the world, have a phone. Who would ever think that most people in the world that would have a phone and be able to go around with a phone? We think it would, if someone told us that 20 or 25 years ago, we would think it was impossible. Some people think that this couldn't happen. 
because of the different time zones. There'd always be a light somewhere. But in the book of Luke chapter 23 and verses 40, 44 to 45, when Jesus was on the cross, it says now at about the sixth hour, there was darkness over the whole earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was torn in two. Jesus came to bring light into that darkness. That means he's the life for the poor. That means he's the life for the rich this morning. He's a light to the, for the black. He's a life for the white, the Jew, the Gentile, the American, the Iranians, the Irish. No matter what, what country we're from today, Isaiah says in 51.4, Listen to me, my people. Hear me, Israel, for my law will be proclaimed and my justice will become a light to the nations. There is no one this morning that is outside the light of the Lord Jesus. Jesus is the light of the world. And without him, our world would remain a very, very dark place. Aren't you glad that he's your light today? Aren't you glad that he's lightened up your life? Secondly, this morning we look at the condition. Life Light is to be enjoyed. Jesus said, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. See, people are, are, are expected to react to light. And there's two basic reactions to light. One reaction is for to, for to hide from the light. I don't know whether you've ever been sitting in a room, sitting in a darkened room for a couple of hours, and then someone comes in and they, you know, they turn on the light, and their first reaction is, I don't know about you, their first reaction is put their hands on, even when you wake up in the morning and someone take, turns on the light, you pull the, the bed covers up back over your head, because the light, the light is too much to take, because we've been in so darkness so long, and it's hard many times to adjust to that brightness. J.R. Tolkien's book, The Hobbit, he tells of a, a creature named Golem. How many's ever heard of Golem? And he lived far below the surface of the earth in the caves of the goblins. And it's always been that way. It hadn't always been that way. At one time, Golem had lived above the, sur the surface just like most people. But he moved underground to escape the world outside. And he lived there so long that he couldn't remember how many years he'd been there. In fact, he couldn't even remember ever having been anywhere else. He became so accustomed to the darkness that the darkness became his friend. And he grew to be repulsed by the thought of life and the goodness of laughter. There's many people like Golem today. We've lived in this world of sin so long that we begin to enjoy it and we begin to think it's the norm. We begin doing things that we never would have considered doing before. And we start to think thoughts many times that would shock us even now. And we find that we're very comfortable in this new world system where right is wrong and wrong is right. And black is white. And there's no longer any moral standard by which we must abide. Isaiah tells us again in, verse, in chapter 5 and verse 20. He says, you are heading for trouble. You say wrong is right and darkness is light and bitter is sweet. Woe to them, another version says. Woe to them that call good evil and evil good. And when the message of the Lord Jesus, the light of the world comes into our lives, we cover our eyes many times and we say, no, 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 turn off the light. I can't take it anymore. And we crawl back down into our comfortable world, a world of darkness and sin. That's one reaction to the light. 
That's one reaction to the light of Jesus. But thank God it's not the only reaction. The second possible reaction is that you and I can run to the light. And we can embrace the light and we make the light our very own. Let's return for a moment to our darkened room. We've been sitting here for a long time and someone flicks the switch. And again, our immediate action is to put our hands up to our eyes again to cover our eyes. But instead of keeping our eyes covered, we find that our eyes are rapidly beginning to adjust to the light. And in a short time, we begin to find the comfort in the light. It helps us to see what's happening. It helps us to see what's going on. It helps us to see what we're doing. It gives us warmth. And it shows us how to get from here to there. And after we've grown accustomed to the light, we no longer desire the darkness. We would rather, we'd rather be in the light, wouldn't we? When Jesus Christ, the light of the world, first comes into our lives, his light often makes us recoil because it exposes the life of sin that we used to live. But if we run to the light, and instead of running away from the light, we find that in a very short time, we'll be able to come accustomed to this light. And not only that, we'll begin to desire the light and we'll not want to go a moment without the light because we will want to continue to enjoy the light. Because the closer we, we draw to the light of Jesus, the more clearly we're able to see. Jesus says that to enjoy the light, we must meet certain conditions. We must first come to the light and then we must follow the light. We must follow the light. I don't know if you remember, the, the, the word of God speaks about the disciples in Palestine, in early Palestine. And when Jesus was saying, follow me, he meant for them to literally follow them. They gave up their homes, they gave up everything, they, they followed Jesus. They followed them to the places and stayed in the places where he was. But the word also means in the sense of following Jesus as his disciple. And today, while there's often, in, there's often in, uh, a following of Jesus, it's not a, not a literal following of a person that we're going to where the person is. It's also used in the meaning of becoming a follower and a seeking of of Jesus and a seeking of his word, a seeking to live according to his teaching. And that's what Jesus was saying when he was saying, follow me. He was saying, follow me. Follow me and you will never walk in darkness and you will have the light of life. Jesus claims to be the light of the world, not just the earth, but of the entire world. So the condition to experience the light is that you and I need to follow Jesus Christ according to his teachings. We need to follow him according to, the, to his teachings. John 14, 23, Jesus said, All who love me will do what I say, and my Father will love them, and we will come and make our home with each of them. So we looked at the claim that Jesus made. We looked at the conditions and now we want to look at the consequences. Because we live in an age of scientific enlightenment, don't we? We live in an age of scientific enlightenment. We can pick up a phone or a mobile phone and we can talk to somebody over the other side of the world. We can turn our computer on and we can watch it do the work of a hundred men in a few minutes. We can receive a transplant if one of our organs fail. Even today we're looking at an amazing miracle of them trying to vaccinate the whole world. Every single person, six point, is it 6.7 billion people in the whole world and they want to vaccinate them all. It seems an impossible task. We can be counseled for any problem that we're suffering. The world waits at our doorstep and runs and bells when we call. 
And although we live in this scientific modern age, we find ourselves in one of the darkest periods of history, morally and spiritually. We have become so enlightened that we now believe it's a woman's right to have an abortion. We have allowed violence and crime. We've allowed drug abuse, sexual perversion, broken homes, political corruption, and international terrorism to be the order of the day. And in the midst of all that we're seeing today, in the midst of it all, the light of the Lord Jesus, the true light that has come into the world, shines more brightly. He said, where sin abounds, the grace of God abounds even more. But with the brightness of the light comes the two reactions that we discussed earlier. Some will shrink back from the light and someone will run, some will run to the light. What are the consequences of these two sets of people? The people that run to the light or the people and the people that reject the light? It's not, God, it's not that God doesn't love us. It's not that God doesn't love these people. He, he just wants them to experience the light. But the thing is, they have made their decision. They've made their choice. They've made their choice to reject the Lord Jesus. So God being a just God, he honors their choice. And in 2 Thessalonians, Paul writes a warning. In 2 Thessalonians 1.9, Paul writes that those who reject the Lord Jesus will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power. Even today, those who don't follow Jesus know something of the presence of God. They're able to enjoy his creation. They're able to enjoy his life. They're able to enjoy his light, rather. They're able to enjoy his provision, his love. But in the end, if Jesus is not followed, the Apostle Paul is saying they'll be completely cut off from the presence of God. There's nothing compared to the thought of being eternally separated from God. And Paul says here that those who reject Christ, this is very, very important, those who reject Christ will be shut out from the presence of God. Shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power. When we reject the light of Christ, we actually reject the presence of God. We're saying, God, we want nothing to do with him and if we make the decision to reject him now it could be we're making an eternal decision to reject him forever do you understand that but there's a positive side also aren't you glad there's a positive side also there's a positive side for those who follow the light they are promised that they will always have the light as certain as there is an eternity of separation from God to those who reject them. There's an eternity of communion for those who accept the Lord Jesus Christ. And the unity we experience with God is but a shadow of the personal relationship that you and I will have with him in eternity. Jesus describes us as possessing the light of life. And this is the life that comes from God. The life that is experienced by those who follow God. It is the life that God gives. And if we're Christians here today, we've already experienced the light of Christ. But even though we're still living in a dark world. But praise God that the day will come when the darkness will be no more. And all you and I will know is the pure light of the presence of Almighty God. How many has ever heard the saying, there's a light at the end of the tunnel? Indeed, friend of mine, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And that light will never be extinguished because that light is the light of life. That light is the Lord Jesus Christ. 
There was a woman. She'd been blind for over 50 years. But she got healed. And the doctors were removing the bandages from her eyes after the, the delicate surgery. And she began to weep with joy. For this was the t first time in her life. That a dazzling, beautiful world of a world of color, world a, a form began to greet her eyes and she began to say. But the amazing thing about the story, however, is that 20 years of her blindness had been unnecessary. She'd been blind for 50 years. But she didn't know the surgical techniques had been developed and an operation could restore her sight and give her vision. The doctor said she had figured that there was nothing that could be done for her condition. Much of her life had been so diff much of her life could have been so different. And when we see this case, some questions come to mind. Why did she continue to assume that the situation was hopeless? Had no one told her about the wonderful advancement of the eye surgery? But then you and I see the plight of those that are, are unreached by the gospel. How many will go on living in spiritual blindness because they've not seen or experienced the light of the Savior? How many will never see the true light that has come into the world? How many have yet to have had the bandages removed from their eyes? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, 4 that Satan who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is, the ex who is in the exact likeness of God. Many doubt. Even some of the disciples doubt. John doubt, and Jesus sent them then back to John in Luke 7, 22. He said, go back to John and tell him what you've seen. Tell him what you've seen and what you've heard. The blind see. The lame walk. The leopards are cured. The deaf hear. The dead are raised to life. And the good news is being preached to the poor. That's good news today. Can you say amen? So you and I, can we, we can have a brighter life. We can have a brighter future if we will follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the light of the world and whoever follows me will never walk in darkness but will have the light of life. I hope this message has been a blessing to you this morning. I hope this Message has given you some hope, has given you the enlightenment to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and don't continue to reject Him because He loves you so much today. Come as you are. Don't pull it off till tomorrow because we're not promised tomorrow and the opportunity is here for you today to accept the light. Accept the light of the world and allow your days to be brighter. Allow them to lighten up your life and to bring a brightness to your day and you will never be the same again. This is a great opportunity after hearing the word of God. Do you remember I said to you that Jesus stands over his word, the performer in our lives. And God wants to perform a miracle in your life today. He wants to bring and give you his light where, there, where there's darkness. By accepting Jesus Christ, you can come to him today and you can be born again. You can have a change, a complete new life. Jesus said, unless a man be born again, he'll never see the kingdom of God. It's like coming out of the darkness and it's like entering into that life. And you have that opportunity to be born again. To be born again and become a Christian, a follower 
of Christ. That's where a Christian is. It's a follower of Christ. And I want to pray right now, and I'd like you to say this prayer with me. If you want to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, just give, indicate to me. Just let me know. Yeah, that's what I want to do. But say this prayer with me right now. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I ask your forgiveness. I believe that you died on the cross for me. I believe you died for my sin and you rose from the dead. And with your help, I torn from my sins and I invite you right now to come into my heart and to come into my life. I want to trust and I want to follow you. I want you as my Lord and Savior. And if you said that prayer right now and you've really meant it, Slip your hand up right now, those that are in the church service here and those that are watching online. Slip up your hand now or just type it in and just let us know that that is your response. And I've got something I want to share with you right now. If you've done that, now you can live your life for Jesus. Just go and live your life for Jesus as best as you can. And now... Your next step, you can grow in your faith by attending the church, by reading the Bible, by praying and getting to know Christians and getting to know who they are. And we're here at Wittenshaw Community Church.org. And if you need any more help or any more information, please don't hesitate to contact us where we can share with you the light of the world. The Lord bless you. We want to thank you for listening and being with us this morning. God bless you.